Hello everybody, uh, my name is Sarah Smith and I'm going to talk about extreme freelancing which for me means uh, writing whilst sailing around the world. So who am I and what do I do? I'm a freelance medical writer. I have more than 20, 20 years of experience working with medcoms agencies and pharma companies. But for the past 10, 11 years I've continued to work while sailing around the world on a yacht with my family. We're currently based in Grenada in the West Indies. Oh, how glamorous, living the dream. Yeah, okay. Um, in reality, working from a yacht involves extreme heat and humidity or a drip of water down the back of your neck, cramped conditions, limited power and crap internet. Because my workspace is the family living space, so I have quite a few challenges in that direction. These photos are me working in the cockpit or in um, at the chart table and I haven't got a light so I'm using a head torch. Those are the sorts of things that I have to deal with. So basically my family life is fused with my work life and life on a boat, particularly our boat, is simpler but not necessarily easier. There are some boats that have everything but we don't. <laughs> so I have limited space, power and internet. On top of that I have limited water, limited language skills in our family, no car, no washing machine, no freezer, no TV, no support network of family and friends. So it isn't quite as glamorous as everybody thinks. This is actually a photograph of the two kids doing the washing. There are two plastic buckets and they're treading it. And that is how we did our washing um, for the past 11 years. So how do you go about uh, disconnecting from the ordinary life and going off and doing something like we did? There's no need to look at the detail here, but basically we did plan this carefully for a few years before we went. One of the first things we did was talk to the accountant as to whether we could do it. Um, I talked to my clients to see whether they'd be happy to use me if I wasn't actually still based in the UK. We found a boat, we rehomed the Labradors, we sold the house and all the junk. The only legal thing we had to do to leave the country was deregister the kids from school. Um, and prove that we were actually going to make an effort to homeschool them properly. Once we left, nobody knows what we'd done. Nobody's ever followed up on it, so our kids could be in slavery. Anyway, we moved on to the boat, we sold um, the cars, we managed to sell the boat we had before, we had a big party and we set sail. So abs we changed absolutely everything in our life apart from the way I worked. Because I was a freelancer working from home, I just moved on to the boat and carried on working. So how does it work from a business perspective? I'm still a UK resident, I'm a UK sole trader, and I have a tax liability in the UK. So it's just like I was still here. To be able to work, I need, and I think that most freelancers would agree that the minimum that you need is a mobile phone, internet access, a laptop, and I have a printer scanner which makes life a little easier. My biggest challenge while moving around has been internet access. And at this point I'd like to say that it is, I think freelance writing and editing has to be one of the most suitable careers to go off and do something different. So um, for me that was combining long-term travel and work. So a uh, perfect career for taking away. Going to the internet challenge. <laughs> Um, over the last 11 years I've seen a huge change in the way internet access is available to somebody who's not plugged into the usual system in the UK or wherever. Uh, when we first left I had a laptop and I had to take it into cyber cafes and plug in an ethernet cable. Then we moved on to Wi-Fi in bars and cafes and I drank a lot of coffee to get my internet to download my email and do my PubMed searching and that sort of thing. As time went on, we got USB dongles to plug in various countries. Um, unfortunately, as we moved around, the dongle for Spain didn't work, and mainland Spain didn't work in the Balearic, so I had to get a new dongle every time we moved. Which is fine if you're staying for six months, but when you're only there for a month, you're actually constantly looking for internet. Um, we did, surprisingly, get 3G internet 150 miles up the river in Gambia. In Gambia, they don't have a terrestrial phone system. Everybody's gone straight onto mobiles, and we, could, uh, we couldn't phone on a landline, but we could get 3G internet in the middle of the river on the boat. 
So it's pretty amazing, really, um, where you find good internet. Um, then when we moved over to the Caribbean, the, there are a lot of people cruising in the Caribbean and there are systems set up where you can buy a package and get Wi-Fi in an anchorage. Um, we ended up hoisting the booster up the mast and it used to get blown off and rusty and various times we'd have to go and get another one. But there are ways of getting your internet if you're desperate. Uh, then I got a dual SIM phone and in the Caribbean I was able to get um, a data package via the local uh, Digicel package and uh, get internet on the boat. If there was a phone signal in the anchorage, I could get internet. So it's definitely got easier. We're spending a bit more on it now, but we're using it for a lot more too. And now I've just come back to the UK and I've got a UK SIM and I can roam with that in the Caribbean. Um, and when I go to Martinique or St. Martin, it's actually uh, European roaming. So things have definitely moved on, um, which has made my life a lot easier. So what is this boat? Here's a picture of the boat. Now the back third of the boat is engine. So um, we have that, it's a 43 foot boat. Um, the front two thirds are where we live. Uh, we had two kids and David and myself my workspace, the homeschool space, the kitchen, the bathroom, the settee are all squished into that little space. Okay, so we set off from Aberystwyth, which is obviously in the little middle bit of Wales. We headed to Ireland and we then headed south across Biscate, directly to that point um, sticking out, which is northern Spain. We worked our way down the coast of Atlantic Spain and Portugal in through the Straits of Gibraltar and ricocheted around the Med a bit. We did the Balearic, Sardinia, Sicily, um, sorry, sorry, Corsica, Sicily, through the Straits of Mati Medi Messina even, um, uh, across to Greece. Then we turned around, went down to Malta and worked our way back out through the Med, through the Straits of, the Gibral Straits of Gibraltar and to the Canaries, which is the first little group of islands um, off Africa. We spent a year there, um, joined up with other boat families, um, had a great time kitting the boat out with solar panels and things to go further and more off grid. We then headed further south to the second, just below the second group of islands, which um, are the Cape Verdes. And we then actually went inland to, uh, into Africa and up the river Gambia. Um, we spent a couple of months up the river then came down the river and crossed the Atlantic to uh, Trinidad, which is a little island just at the top of South America there. And you can see the island chain, the Eastern Caribbean island chain. This is where Maria and Irma did all their damage last year. So we're right at the bottom end of the chain. We worked our way up the chain and back down the chain and up the chain and down the chain. And basically Grenada is at the bottom end of that chain. And um, Grenada and Trinidad are the places where everybody goes during the hurricane season because the hurricanes are usually pushed north by South America. So most of the yachts are now down in that area um, waiting for the hurricane season um, to pass. And that'll be November, they'll all start moving again. So our Atlantic crossing took 26 days. There were just the four of us. Um, the kids caught up on their schoolwork and we slept and read. We had a very quiet passage, which is great. Um, so that, when I said we're sailing around the world, we haven't got very far yet. I don't think I'm going to live long enough to go right round. So that's been our cruising ground so far. And we visited at least 25 countries and sailed more than 15,000 miles uh, slowly. 11 years so far. So I thought, oh great, I can show all my photos. <laughs> I have a very impressive collection of photos of sunsets and of lighthouses, but I won't inflict those on you. Um, one of the major things combining my family and work life was the fact that we were homeschooling the kids alongside me working. So our family life is very intertwined. There's no break between work and life ordinary life um, when we, the way we chose to do this. So Bethany and Bryn, you can see them there, were seven and nine when we left. Uh, Bryn is now 18. Bethany unfortunately died in an accident 18 months ago. She would have been 20 this year. And boy, are we so glad we, did, we went and did something different, knowing what was around the corner. So 
Homeschooling dictated a lot of what we did and where we went. I was working alongside all of this, um, but it, was, it provided a great structure for where we were going to go and what we were going to look at. Um, somebody who didn't have kids would maybe choose the wines of uh, Italy or something like that. Um, so maths and English, I follow, we followed the national UK national curriculum for most of their materials, but the rest of it we made up. We just, as we went along, we did all the things that were relevant to the places we were. So we did a lot of volcanoes. We did the Romans. We went to Italy to do the Romans. And we went to Greece and we did the ancient Greeks. Um, we covered slavery, slavery in Gambia and the Caribbean. The children did art. We had an art course. They both learned to play instruments. My kids can say, yes, please. Yes, no, please, thank you. Where's the toilet? And uh, can we have two Cokes and two beers, please? In four languages. Um, and I'm afraid that's, we haven't needed much more than that. Uh, physics and chemistry. Uh, sailing is all about navigation. Um, and the actual practical part of sailing is all physics. They did scuba diving. And we took the opportunity to visit rum distilleries for, for physics and chemistry in the Caribbean. Fauna and flora, wherever we went. And the rest of it, um, they're very, children are very involved in boat life. There's no way they can get away from it. Plus, when we were homeschooling, we only did two, maybe three hours of school a day. And the rest of it was, uh, was projects and just living. So we did volcanoes in the Aeolian Islands. The Aeolian Islands are just uh, north of Sicily. Um, and Volcano is a mud, sulfur mud volcano. And we walked up that track, the diagonal track up there to peer down into the sulfurous mud at the bottom and the children's crocs melted on the way up. <laughs> um, that's Bryn on the top. So uh, yeah, we, we walked a few uh, volcanoes. And this is in Morocco. And this is a caldera, which is a flooded um, uh, ah, basin that looking down into the, um, what's the word? The, the bit where the mm, sulfurous mud and lava comes out. Anyway, that's a caldera, a flooded caldera in Morocco um, that we walked around. We went to Greece. We went to Athens and saw all the sites in Athens. We went to Delphi and saw everything in Delphi. And that was a really spooky place, an incredible place. And in, we also went to Olympia and uh, looked where they, lit, lit, where they light the Olympic flame. And, every, and we ran on the original running track. Now, when they light the Olympic flame, they actually do it using the sun in this, this particular temple in Olympia. Um, and they, carry, they light the flame and they carry that on through. And we saw the Olympic flame being carried through Messalonghi in Greece because that was where we were based that winter. Um, but they desperately try to use it using, uh, light it using a mag magnifying glass. And it's considered uh, very bad luck if they have to resort to a lighter or a, a match to light the Olympic flame. There's also the tunnel, you know, the tunnel that runs out onto all the football pitches. There's one of those there running into the Olympic Stadium, which is uh, taken from the Greek uh, tunnel that they use traditionally. Uh, in Gambia, Gambia was mind blowing. Uh, Africa is just so different to anywhere else we've been. Um, that is Lamin Lodge. And we were in that top part of there looking down and Cape is the white boat you can see. Uh, in the anchorage and it was just mangroves. It took us uh, well over a week to get out of the mangroves when we went up the river um, and sometimes the river is so wide you can't see the sides. It's five miles wide and you have to go down the middle because that's where the channel is. So just a, w a week of, of, of motoring or sailing up the middle stopping for the tide to turn and then we got into the fresh water and there was the wildlife. Um, we saw hippopotami and crocodiles um, birds and uh, warthogs and it was just incredible and it was all around us because um, near the boat and in um, when we went walking inland. Um, this is James Island uh, which is at the mouth of the River Gambia. We un anchored off that for three days and didn't see it because there was a sandstorm. So the Saharan red dust you see you get over here occasionally we were just pink. The whole boat was pink. The ropes were pink because of the of the dust. Um, and that is the island where all the slaves were gathered by the Portuguese and the English before being shipped across the Caribbean. So if anybody remembers um, the, 
slavery thing with Kunta Kinte. What was that? The uh, Roots. This is where, he, I know it was discredited later, but it's the story of him being taken from Gambia and crossing the um, Atlantic to the Caribbean. And he would have been held on that island. So um, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing going back to these places and seeing the real thing rather than reading about it or um, seeing it on film or um, whatever. We have also done Caribbean beaches and rainforest. Uh, there are some absolutely beautiful beaches out there. Uh, but I have to say, beaches are OK, but you've been on one beach, you've been on them all. <laughs> um, the rainforest is uh, stunning, and every Caribbean island has a, set, a patch of rainforest in the middle. So um, we've done a lot of walks and uh, nature walks and that sort of thing in rainforest, um, which is uh, been fantastic to learn about flora and fauna and just something very different. And this is a, a group of the boat kids learning about rum and you have Caribbean rum and you have Caribbean rum. Caribbean rum with an H is uh, agri rum agricole as loved by the French and that um, is very, has a very different production method to the uh, rum which is uh, Pirates of the Caribbean rum, the dark rum. Um, basically Rum agricole is made fresh from the sugar cane and has to be done instantly, whereas the Caribbean rum, the dark rum, is made from molasses and is a slower process, so um, can be uh, taken over time. And this is our particular favourite, which is from uh, Guyana. And Guyana is one of uh, Guyana and Suriname are two Caribbean nations. They're not actually islands. They're actually on uh, just below. Um, the top end of Venezuela. So, um, yeah, we, and rum is a huge culture thing in the Caribbean, and there are as many rums as there are uh, malt whiskies. Each one is slightly different, and some islands have got 15 or 16 of their own uh, different sorts of rums. So, um, other things we've uh, enjoyed about moving around like this is food. The food around the world obviously is incredible. We always try and go to the markets and we always try and eat the local food. Uh, the fusions of the food and reflecting the peoples that have lived in various places like Trinidad has a huge number of Indian um, population that have bit, were brought in to work the sugarcane fields there. So Trinidad has totally different food to Grenada, which is the next island up. So it just depends on the, uh, the slaves that were brought in and obviously the produce that's available locally. Uh, music has been something we have found everywhere we've gone and has been a great source of friends um, and entertainment. And that uh, little boy there is Bryn, who is now much, much taller than me, but we used to get together with other cruisers and people and locals too to play music and have barbecues. And often that is because you don't know people in the area, you gather together and you have to just make your own entertainment. We don't have television, so we do things like play music in the evenings. Uh, and as you, that, those flags are a reflection of the people who are staying in that uh, area for the winter. So the types of uh, group, the cult, multicultural group that we, was, we were with. So um, that's a little bit of a taster of what my life for the past 11 years has been. And I would say that um, if you want to do something different, freelance writing and editing certainly gives you the flexibility to do that. And with a bit of planning, if that's the sort of long term travel um, uh, while you work uh, is uh, well worth doing. Uh, not easy, but very, very rewarding. Um, and if anybody's interested, we've got a horribly out of date blog. I think it's three years out of date, but it follows us from we left, when we left Aberystwyth 11 years ago um, up to when we got into the Caribbean. So thank you very much. <laughs>